about a year ago, a boy walked into my office in Yeshiva and he said to me, I don't understand this whole Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur thing. I don't need it. You see, you keep telling us Rosh Hashanah Kippur is about building this beautiful relationship with Hashem and asking for forgiveness and being in awe and fear of Hashem. And I already have a relationship with Hashem. I feel very close to Him. Yeah, Avina Malkeinu, please, I, I don't need that. Everything I do every day, I get up and I go David and I learn and I do Chesed and I am awesome. I don't need anything else. So what's the big deal with Rosh Hashanah Kippur? So I contemplated this question for a while and I, I want to share with you the answer I gave him. <clears throat> I want us to transfer ourselves for a moment from where we're sitting to a beautiful kingdom with an amazing, awesome king who loves his people and who's loved by the entire world looks up to him. One of the greatest leaders of his time. And you have the privilege of not just being a servant of his, but being a servant of his who works in his personal family kitchen. So, in the morning, when the king gets up and strolls in in his pajamas to get a cup of coffee, it's you who fills that cup of coffee. When his kids run in, it's you who gives them snack and packs their lunches as they go out to school. When it's family dinner time, it's you who serves it, and you get to hang out with the royal family. So much so, that the king, the queen, the princes and princesses treat you like family. You're literally part of the royal family, except that you're a servant, but you're part of the royal family. And obviously, when you come to work, you come dressed appropriately, and you act in a most respectful manner, but there's a certain closeness, and, and almost a family love, that comes with your job. Maybe even sometimes you overhear things that are secretive, or not really public knowledge, and you know, the king has to remind you, shh, don't doubt, right? <clears throat> Once a year, when the entire world comes to visit the king for the anniversary of his coronation, you know, the loud trumpets play and the king walks in and sits down in front of the room and there are leaders from all over the world that are there. Once a year, on that date, different servants have the opportunity to stand before the king and deliver praise in front of all these people. And it just so happens that you got picked. It's total random. The king himself is so proud that you got picked because you're literally part of his family. And he can't wait for that day when you're going to walk into the throne room in front of everybody and you're going to praise him. Meantime, you're preparing. Are you scared? No. You're in awe. You're honored. You're excited. The anticipation is great. You pre-press your clothing weeks in advance, you decide what you're going to wear and who's going to do your hair and everything's all planned. When that day arrives, you put on your best pair of clothing you've chosen a long time ago. You make sure you look exactly perfect, even on your way and you stop in the mirror just to check and make sure. Because you know that praising this king right now in front of the entire world audience is his greatest honor. And of course, by default, it's, it's your greatest honor, too. Now, when you walk in before the king, you don't walk in and say, Yo! How was the coffee this morning? Because that, would, that wouldn't look good for him. And as it so happens, the entire family is sitting there, the whole royal family. You walk in the room, the audience is, is packed. There are princes and noblemen and the greatest gathering possible. And because it's his 25th anniversary, it's even more than usual. And you walk up to the front, and sure, there are butterflies in your stomach. There's a little bit of concern you might do something wrong. In no way would you ever want the king to feel that you didn't honor him as best as possible because this is your king and you love him, and he loves you. You walk up to the front of the room, the trumpets play, and you stand before the king, Straighten yourself out. Take a deep breath and then begin your praise in the most professional way possible, using your prescripted praise that you've practiced again and again and again. You've stood in front of a mirror for the last seven months practicing those words and the speed and the pauses and the timing and the very placement of how you stand. And you praise the king 
and the king sits there with the most professional and straight face possible. Because that's what the king does for everybody. The difference is when you're done and you look back at the king, he throws you a quick wink. <sighs> that built up relationship pays off. You walk back out before the king and you can't really smile. But you're so happy and you know the king is happy and you come to dinner that night to serve dinner and everybody's so excited, they're so proud of you because you did it. I said to this boy, that is our relationship with Hashem. If you've got that great relationship, you're the servant who works in his, in his private quarters. You stand there, Hashem and Kippur, sure, you want to make him look great. And you want to make sure you're praising him appropriately. So that afterwards, you can go back to private quarters and sit there and that wink is so powerful. That moment that he smiled at you and said, that was awesome. When you fill his coffee the next day, he's like, wow, that was the greatest. And that closeness becomes even greater. That is Sukkot that follows Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. By the way, all this is from the text of Ladav and Hashem Arivishi. It follows this pattern. Sure, if we have this amazing relationship, then we're awesome and we stand before Hashem and we praise Him. It's us being so personal in front of the entire universe. And He gives us back that little wink. And the shofar blows, and we know we're standing there, and he's looking over what we've done because he has to judge us the way he judges the rest of the world. With a little bit of a smile, though. Because we're his children. We're the servants who work in his kitchen. We are his family. And then, my friends, we take a moment and we look at this year. And what a year it's been. Twelve months ago, we prepared for Russian Yom Kippur. And we stood and we davened and we built up our relationship. We went into Sukkot and we celebrated. It rained the first night of Sukkot this past year. If you remember, we stood outside in the rain and made Kiddush quickly. And then went inside and have our, had our suda. And some of us might have thought, wow, maybe Hashem's telling us He doesn't really want our mitzvot. And maybe Hashem's telling us, I love you so much and I want to see how you uphold your relationship with me, even challenging times. And that has truly identified what this year is. This past year has been upholding a relationship in challenging times. Anti-Semitism was on the rise. There was an attack in Muncie. I had the privilege, challenging privilege, of joining a crisis response team in Muncie two days after the attack and meeting with families of those who were present and those who lived nearby and hearing stories of people who, who were dealing with their children and their families and their friends and going to school Hanukkah was tough. Post Hanukkah was tough. But it wasn't too cold until the Sea of Mashas. Sat in Madison in a, a stadium, MetLife Stadium, with a hundred thousand people celebrating Torah. That was the only cold day of the year. It snowed, there were flurries around. It was 24 degrees, maybe 27 degrees on my phone, I think, in the bleachers where we were. And we listened towards the Torah, and we celebrated the completion of 2,711 pages of Talmud, of the constant learning of our Masorah. And we thought, wow, how beautiful. And we came home, and shortly after we began preparing for Purim, and our relationship with Hashem was strong. And then we started hearing about this, this pandemic headed our way, world pandemic. And on March 13th, we made an announcement, all the schools, all the shows were closing. And at that time we said, the highlight moment, the greatest moment of a wedding is the Yicharum. When the Chatan and Kala go together by themselves, close the door, it's just the two of them. That is what became of our relationship. It just became us and Hashem. Forget the outside world, forget the show. Forget those audiences that were there. Now it's just the family privately. And we're feeling that cup of coffee and we're getting that good morning smile. And we can react one of two ways. We can be exhausted and tired and say this is ridiculous. Or we can say, you want to know how I act during challenges? It just strengthens my relationship. So we found a way to daven every day with or without a minyan. And learn every day with or without classes. And we learned on Zoom. And we communicated with our friends, and we sent out the Torah, and we learned, and we inspired ourselves. 
Somebody said to me two weeks ago, I don't really want there to be Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur this year. I don't know how I'm going to stand before Hashem. And I said, I'm so excited to stand before Hashem. All I've done for the last six months was continue to prepare and strengthen that relationship. I filled the king's coffee. I served the king dinner. I constantly worked on my relationship. When I stand before the king at the coronary celebration, I don't have words to say. It's just a wink because we're so close. You know, my friends, the main mitzvah on Rosh Hashanah, if you look in the Torah, in Parshat Emar, the Torah tells us what's the mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah. It's, it's a mitzvah of, of teruah. It's blowing shofar. That's it. I, I might think that if it's day of coronation, every one of us should have a mitzvah to write a piyot, a poem, that wraps up our year and praises Hashem moving forward. I don't know if it was my birthday. That's what I like, like read, reading cards that say, you're such a wonderful this, you're such a wonderful that. It makes me feel good. On Rosh Hashanah, the mitzvah, and it has been since the day of creation, the mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah is to blow, to hear the sounds of the shofar. Why shofar? Of all the things, it doesn't say any words. It's just... We don't even know what it's supposed to sound like. Maybe... Maybe... And maybe it's all of it together. And therefore we blow a hundred sounds. We don't even know what they mean. I saw a beautiful explanation as to why shofar. Exactly for that reason. It doesn't say anything. Because each and every person has a different relationship with the Melech Malchei Hamlachim, with Avinu Malkeinu. Our relationship individually is based on us. And Hashem understands that. So for some people, this year has been super full of anxiety. And that's the relationship. And for some people, this has been amazing. I got to go bike riding every day. I got to have hot breakfast and hot lunch and hot dinner. I hung out with my family. For some people, it's been tough. They may have lost a job. They may be still working and not getting paid. That shofar represents your inner feelings with that relationship. So when you stand before Melech Malchem Lachem, and you say, Avinu Malkeinu, on one hand is our father, on the other hand is our king, he's both. And I'm standing here and the great audience is looking, and I need to praise the Melech of the universe. The sound of the shofar represents what I'm feeling in my relationship. My father, my king above. It's been a tough year. It's no secret. And we've overcome those challenges. And every day we continue to work on that relationship with you. We don't know what you want from us, but we're still doing it. And hopefully, when we finish praising him, he winks at us. And he smiles. So that on Sukkot, when we go out of our houses, which is something we really haven't done much of the last six months, and we sit outside, and we celebrate our oneness with Hashem, it's not just a wink. It's a closeness. It's a love. That's this Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited about it. I can't wait to stand before our Kaddish Baruch and say, Look what I've done with our relationship. It's been challenging. It's been tough. But that doesn't have a negative effect. That strengthens our relationship. I jokingly said to someone that I haven't been late for davening once in the last six months. Three months of it, I didn't have a minion. And the other three, it's been right here. How could I be late? There are only ten of us. We've learned to see our lives differently. And we've learned, hopefully, to appreciate our relationship with Hashem differently. This year, Rosh Hashanah, when we hear the sound of the shofar, think about ourselves as the servant who serves in the private quarters of the king. And through COVID, we've been there with the king and his family. We've been quarantined with Hashem and with the Malachim. Think about how that looks at us. We're awesome and amazing people. Such a wonderful relationship with Hashem. The end of Kippur, when we say, Hashem Hu Elohim, or in the middle, when we say, Nisan Tokef, think about 
what it is that we're asking for. The truth is, we're just asking for that relationship to continue without the challenges. We know that it's up to Hashem how this is going to go. But it's up to us how we're going to feel. Hopefully this year, Hashem will write us in the book of, of life and good health. And at the very least, give us the strength to overcome the challenge that we're living through currently. We should all be written in the book of good life and good health. And this year should be a year of success and joy in which we learn how to overcome challenges. Chag Tzimech, Ksivach Timatova, Shana Tava.